welcome to Lessons with Jeff Thompson. Uh, today we're going to be talking about Animal Day, the very controversial Animal Day. T to be honest with you, Animal Day shouldn't be controversial, it should just be something everybody does. But it's been taken out of context by the media, um, by the uninitiated especially. Um, animal Day to me is not about becoming a great fighter, it's about working, it's, it's about putting pressure on your techniques and your character to see whether it's going to work in, in a real situation. It's also about finding out who you are. Um, my animal day sessions are not playgrounds for doormen, although we do have doormen on. We have graduates, doctors, policemen, we have all sorts of people come on there and they don't come on to learn to have a fight. I don't class myself as a fighter. I class myself as somebody that can defend myself. The reason I've been successful, um, with as much modesty as I can get, is because I've pressure tested what I've got. When I take the step from the dojo to the street, it's not such a big step, because I've put my technique and my character under pressure, um, and I've learned what is and what isn't, and I've learned who I am. So people come to Animal Day to find themselves, to find out who they are. When you step into Animal Day, when you step into the pressure syndrome, it's a character x-ray. So you can see right through yourself. If I'm the instructor, I can see right through you too. I can see your weaknesses and strengths. This is where the enlightenment comes from. Enlightenment um, is 360, 360 degree peripheral awareness of yourself. Your strengths, your weaknesses. Um, it, it teaches you everything about yourself. To, to be successful in any aspect of life, but especially in martial arts or in real fighting, we need to know who we are. We need to know how we're going to react under pressure. We need to become a body and mind mechanic. So, <clears throat> Animal Day is about that. Um, it's not really anything unique. Uh, the name perhaps distorts the Animal Day, but I think the people we're dealing with on the streets are animals. So we've got to learn to deal with them. So Animal Day, the term, you can forget the term. It doesn't mean anything. Okay, basically we're just learning to find out what works and what doesn't, and to strengthen our character. If you're going to deal with a real situation, and in fact if you're going to deal with this sticky world, the way that society is becoming, you've got to be 20 stone here. I don't want to be 20 stone on here, because, because that's not where it's at. I need to be 20 stone in here. The way to do a barbell curl with the grey matter is adversity. If you step into adversity, which is Animal Day, um, that will build you, your mental physique. What Animal Day does as well is it exposes you to the disguises of fear. 25 centuries ago, a general called Sun Tzu said, if you know your enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know only your enemy and not yourself, you'll lose 50 and win 50. If you know, um, if you know your, yourself but not your enemy, then you'll lose 50 and you'll win 50. If you know not yourself nor your enemy, then you'll lose them all. So what we're doing in this, in this day and age is mostly we're working with antiquated martial arts. Most of the people who train in the martial arts don't understand the enemy they're dealing with. The enemy of today is not um, a match fighter, it's not really an ambush fighter, it's a, it's a fighter who comes through dialogue, like a, uh, like a, a three second fighter. This is something we'll talk about um, in the three second fighter video about the sniper option. Um, what, what we're doing here is we're basically just putting our own system under pressure. A bit like Fairburn and Sykes did. Fairburn and Sykes policed Shanghai, which was supposed to be the toughest city in the world, and they policed it in um, the early part of this century. Now, people were getting murdered every, every night of the week in Shanghai. Um, Fairburn and Sykes uh, were getting people in who were Olympic standard with a gun, but they were getting killed on the first night on duty because they were not used to firing under pressure. They could fire at black marks and targets, but they couldn't fire under pressure. So Fair, Fairburn designed uh, a method of teaching people under pressure so that when they came to reality, it worked for them. Um, this is where the killing house comes from in Hereford. If you look at the way the police train their, their officers for riots, they use lighted Molotov cocktails. Okay, it, it's, it's real. And that's all we're doing here. We're not doing anything different from anybody else. What we're doing is we're putting our art under pressure. Um, going back to Sun Tzu, understanding the enemy is something that we're going to deal with in the three-second fighter video. <clears throat> At the moment, we're understanding that we want to 
learn more about understanding ourselves. Understanding yourself is understanding the disguises of fear. We need to know how we're going to react when we get pain, when we get nausea, um, when we're outweighed, um, outsized, or just out of our depth when we're facing numbers. We've got to look at every kind of stimuli you can get in a real situation. And in the controlled environment, we, can, we want to measure our response to how we're going to deal with a real situation. So we do that by putting pressure, uh, putting people under pressure in the training. If you're a kicker, I'll make you box, or I'll make you wrestle. If you're a wrestler, I'll make you kick or box. Um, whichever, whichever your art is, I'll make you fight at a foreign range. Okay, so it's partly about understanding your art as well. I mean, are you a long-range kicker, a long-range, uh, a short-range kicker, a long-range puncher, short-range puncher? Are you a grappler? Uh, are you an Aikido man? Whatever you are, look for what you're not. If you're a kicker, then you, you pressure, your pressure points are going to be grappling and punching. If you're a puncher, it's going to be kicking and grappling. So your animal day will be taking yourself outside of your comfort zone and putting yourself in a foreign field. You can be a fifth dan standing up, but you're still, a gra you're still a white belt when you're on the floor. If you do animal day in your own club, um, obviously with some degree of control and some people, you know, some supervision, uh, you will start to find that your fourth and fifth bands are losing against your white belts or your yellow belts or your green belts. Because a green belt who's worked on the door and done a bit of rugger won't stand and exchange punches or kicks with the fifth down, it will just thrape him to the floor. So what we've got to do is we've got to uh, find the pressure. Understanding yourself is understanding the disguises of fear. Um, fear comes in many different forms and it tricks people. Um, <clears throat> for instance, we've got think-fight fear. This is pre-confrontation. Think-fight fear is when you, when you have anticipation of a conflict. If someone rings me up and says they're going to come and get me next week, then I'll have slow secretions of adrenaline for a week. Now, although it's not adrenal dump, it's not very fast, it is caustic, and within a week I could lose the fight from the inside out. So think-confrontation fear is something to look out for. Um, we've got pre-post-fight fear. Pre-post-fight fear is something that a lot of people uh, bottle out with. They don't bottle out because, um, really because they're scared, they bottle out because they don't understand it. Okay, so understanding the disguises of fear, understanding the mechanics of your own body is what is, what is going to get you through a situation. Knowledge is power. Pre-post-fight confrontation is um, is when you anticipate the consequence of a fight or, or, a, or a situation. That is, if I've got a bloke in front of me who's got three brothers, then my pre-post-fight fear is if I, ble if I beat this guy in front of me, his three brothers are going to come down. So I bottle out before the fight because I'm worried about the consequence. The consequence could be the law. I could be worried about police involvement. I could wor be worried about being hurt or hurting my opponent. This is pre-post-fight fear. This is natural apprehension, but lots of people uh, balk at the doorway of uh, confrontation because they're worried about the consequence. The bottom line is, if someone's pushed you so far that you've got to fight, you're in the shit anyway, because your worst-case scenario and your best-case scenario are both as bad. Worst-case scenario is you've got aftermath. Best-case scenario is he's going to give you a good idea if you don't fight back. The way to deal with pre-post-fight fear is to look at the consequence of what you're going to do in your game plan and accept it. I accept the fact that if I beat Joe Bloggs and his three brothers come down, I'm going to have to fight them as well. If justification is my ally, then I'm not too worried about it. Uh, after pre-post-fight fear, we've got pre-fight fear, which is adrenal dump, or what uh, Jim Brown on the bodyguard training courses would call the wow factor. This is when there's no anticipation when you don't see a situation develop, when you've got no awareness and adrenaline hits you at 100 miles an hour. This is the hardest one to control, okay, because you've got no, absolutely no awareness of it coming and so it, you have to train your reactions to override it. This is probably the most dangerous of the lot. Um, then we have secondary adrenaline or peripheral adrenaline, which they're two different things, but secondary adrenaline is uh, if I've had a situation um, and the situation has been resolved, I go back into a state of no awareness. I lose my Zan Shin. So I've got a confrontation um, and the bloke in front of me, uh, a say bottled out or, or maybe a fought him, 
and I go into a celebration state or I get an endorphin release and I'm thinking the fight's over, all of a sudden one of his friends comes from out the blue and he wants to go. That's secondary adrenaline, that's because you've gone from um, fight or flight right back to being switched off and the secondary adrenaline's caught you. Peripheral adrenaline is when you're dealing with the situation, you've got it in control, and all of a sudden somebody comes from out of the periphery and gets involved as well. Now, we get tunnel vision in our sight, we also get tunnel vision in our thinking, in our awareness. So because I don't see the bloke coming in and he suddenly attacks me from the side, or threatens me from the side, I get a second or a third kick of adrenaline from the periphery. And that can, that can force me to bottle out, can force me to freeze. Um, We've also got uh, in-fight fear. This is within a fight. You're fighting away. Once you actually make the decision to fight, to defend yourself, and you get into the situation, that caustic feeling goes because the adrenaline's being utilised. But sometimes within a fight, if you find yourself on your back or you find yourself in pain or being hit, the body will release a second or a third kick of adrenaline to help you out in fight. What we tend to do in fight is mistake it for fear. Um, and again, this can cause us to capitulate, can cause us to bottle out. So if you expect it, it's not so bad. So this is in-fight fear. Well, whilst, in, whilst adrenaline is a turbo drive, it makes you faster, it makes you stronger, and it gives you anaesthesia to pain, it is also exactly what I've just said, a turbo drive. It will use up your fuel twice as quick. So, you know, um, your energy levels are going uh, to just go straight down the drain. And then the last one is post-fight fear. Post-fight fear is after the situation's finished, generally the first thing that happens is even if you win, you'll get, uh, even if you win or lose, you'll get a kind of endorphin release, you'll get a natural high and then you'll sit down and you'll start getting slow secretions of adrenaline because you're, you're uh, anticipation con uh, anticipating consequence. That is, I've had a fight with Joe Bloggs, is he going to come back and have another fight? Are the police going to come round? Is he going to go home and fall into a coma because I knocked him out? Um, has he got three brothers? Has, is he connected? This is aftermath. So I started getting slow secretions again in anticipation of consequence. Again, you have to prepare for this by accepting whatever the worst case scenario is. And then if you're working in, in, um, in like uh, uh, a stressful environment, like working on the doors or in security, you've got adrenal combo. And that is basically a combination of all the feelings and all the adrenal releases I've just, just said there. So you're constantly anticipating situations, you're constantly getting them, and you're constantly anticipating consequences of, of situations that have gone by. Now, your best way around this is understanding it. Understand your body mechanics so it doesn't trick you. Tends to suck my heart's beating a little bit, but I feel alright as it goes. I feel lost and in control. <laughs> Spike. I'm pretty nervous. It's not my first time doing this, so I'm pretty nervous, but I'll be alright. I feel alright. I'm shitting myself because it's my first time as well. So I can get it out of the way. It's the best thing for me. I'm anxious. I want to get it over and done with as quick as I can. I know it's going to be tough. Everyone here is good. I know I could get beat. I'm pretty scared. Can't wait to get it over and done with. A bit nervous, but I'm on the whole looking forward to it. I've done them before and very much looking forward to it. I feel apprehensive. Uh, but you look around and uh, everybody else. They seem to be handling it, and you take strength off them and feel that you can uh, actually handle the situation that's going to happen. Quite nervous, and just want to get it done with, and that's it. Quite nervous. I feel a bit nervous, a bit of flies in the old stomach, but I try to handle it by not thinking about what's going to happen, put it out of my mind. I'm just waiting to get it over and done with now. Was really bags of anticipation, <laughs> belly going a bit, but uh, you know, grab it, control it, hopefully uh, put it into my into my fight. You know, too bad. It's just another animal day, really. And 
It's the worst thing is a camera. I'm a bit nervous about filming me. I want to put on a good show. But they're all capable lads here, so they're all, you know, they're all capable of giving me a good fight, so it should be a good day. Okay, we're going to start off with vertical grappling. What we're going to try and do is, uh, is separate all the ranges. Um, this will force non-kickers to kick, non-punchers to punch, non-grapplers to grapple. So it forces you into a syndrome, um, into an area that, that's foreign to you. Okay, this will allow you to see weaknesses and build on your weaknesses. So to start off with, we're going to be doing vertical grappling. vertical grappling is knee and techniques headbutting biting whatever you can get a lot of people a lot of people seem to think it's easy to strike once you're in vertical grappling range it's not easy a lot of people talk about how easy they would get an elbow strike in once you're tangled up once your arms are tied it's really difficult you're basically left with your head and your knees um, once you're in this position you're likely to end up on the floor anyway so if you can get your elbows in and get your strikes in that's great this is, the, this is the place to try and find out whether it's going to work for you. Don't forget, we're not at this range, we're working at here. Once you're in here, it's very difficult to get anything in because his grip in my arms is going to stop me doing it. So, again, you've got to try and get them in. What we'll do now is progress to all-out vertical grappling. Anything goes. What we're doing is we're disabling uh, the bare hand knuckle punch because uh, it just opens people up and it damages too much. So we're going to give it an open hand strike. Elbows, if you want to get the elbows in, you can do it. Okay, you ready? <laughs> Right on the vertical fighting you notice there's not a, lo a lot of clean work and that's because scruffy is where it's at. In reality it's the scruffy techniques that work. So rather than having an aesthetic throw you tend to have a more in pull down. But as long as you end in a prone position and you can finish the fight from the floor that's okay. It's also not that easy to put in clean butts and clean strikes because the distance and the opponent won't allow it. Once you've got compliancy it all works. When you take compliancy out, when you pull the rug of compliancy from under the martial arts, most of it doesn't work. 
So what we're doing here is we're trying anything. If we can get elbows in, we'll get them in. If we can get knees in, we'll get them in. But most of the time, it may be one strike and then pull down. What we're doing now is we're going to do back-to-back -back ground fighting. Again, this is isolating ground fighting. Okay? Um, this will force someone who doesn't like being on the ground to fight from the ground. You can isolate as much as you want. You can make somebody fight from the back, fight from their belly, so that you put them in a bad position and make them fight their way out of it. What you've got to do is take away their main artillery, which might be punching, and put them on the ground. Or if their main artillery is groundwork, make them punch. And this, this again, will put you into a, a semi-animal day. So this is 50%. This is where a little bit of compliancy comes in, and they're actually going to try and uh, work on new moves. And then we're going to do 100%. Okay, go. What we'll do now is go to all out ground fighting. So we're still starting from the floor, so we're restricting it to the floor. But if you can get a bite in, a butt in, a gouge in, then you're going to go for it. Um, with the bite in, we bite and release. It's accepted that if I bite someone's ear, they've lost it. Uh, with the gouge in, you touch the eye and release. It's also accepted that if, you, if you've touched the eye, um, that they would have lost the eye in a real fight, and it probably would have ended the fight. But uh, a lot of the fighters out there on the street today are using biting and gouging as a first line attack. So if you're not used to defending against it, you're going to get beaten with it. That's why we include it. We don't restrict ourselves to any, any blow. We try and temper it a little bit. Like with the bare knuckle fighting, we try and use open hand because uh, if you don't every single fight, you're going to get busted open. So we're restricting a little bit. We don't restrict the elbows because it's very difficult for get to get elbows in anyway. Um, so elbows, headbutts, anything else is allowed. With a bite, you bite and release. With a gouge, you touch and move. You don't actually uh, go to disable people with it. Um, and same as what I said before, if they tap, you release straight away. So this is 100% ground fighting, just on the floor. Go. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
we're doing now is we're restricting just to, just to punching. So if you're a kicker, we're forcing you just to punch. Uh, this, this will teach you to be a better puncher, it'll also teach you to defend against punching. To start off with, we're developing the technique on the pads. You can do it on the bags, uh, you can do it on any hit, any hit implement you want. Basically we're looking at full contact, 100% shots. Muscle memory will go with the majority. That is, if you're used to throwing pull blows, that's what you'll throw when spontaneity takes the reins. So we're working on hitting hard, so that if we become spontaneous in a real fight, we'll hit hard. You only get out what you put in. So this is the way we train to get accuracy, power, footwork, timing, etc., etc. So this is pad work. Okay, go. What we're going to work on now is restricted sparring with the hands. You can do this with any range. You can do it um, with kicking, punching, grappling, anything you want. What you're doing is you're restricting a person just to one technique. What this does is it means you, you, you're isolating maybe a jab or a cross or a hook and you're making people do thousands of techniques with that one punch. We'll also do some stuff in a minute where we restrict people to attack and defense. One person attacks, one person defends. This again makes you makes a, an attacking fire to work on defense, a defensive uh, fire to work on attack. And again, if it's a weak area, it makes him work on a weak area. So he's forever in the pressure syndrome. This is working on jabs. You can, you can do it with anything you want. It doesn't have to be a jab, it can be anything. And you can, some, some of the stuff we'll do later is restricting systems, like we'll have a puncher against a kicker. Okay, so this is restricted to just jabs. now is work on uh, all-out punching. The natural extension is elbows, if you can get them in, that's great. Um, we're going to work with no limitations, full contact, anything goes. The only thing we're restricting is the fact that it's just hands.
now is restricting the kicking distance. I've always said that kicking distance is the weakest of the main artillery ranges, uh, mostly because it's not that people can't kick or they can't kick powerful, it's just that in a real situation you very rarely have the distance. It's usually talking distance or less, which is conversation range. But the chain is only as strong as its weakest link. You need to be able to kick. If you come up against somebody um, in a match fight who is a better uh, puncher and grappler than you, then you really need to be kicking him. If a, if a chap falls to the floor, then kicking is a brilliant finishing distance. The same with everything, we're just going to give you shortcuts of it. What we're working on now is um, one person kicking, one defending. This will force somebody who is not a kicker to learn how to defend against kicks. Um, it will force someone that's not a kicker to kick. Okay, so one is defending, one is attacking. now is a kicker against a kicker. Again, exactly the same as before, I don't want to keep repeating it, but we're forcing people to kick. We're not allowing them to kick, we're not allowing them to punch, we're not allowing them to grapple. We're forcing them to fight at a foreign range. If they're kickers, that's great, but if they're not, uh, if they're punchers and grapplers, then we're taking them out of their comfort zone. Okay, What we're doing now is we're combining ranges. Now, th these are all uh, training methods that I do and have devised myself. Nothing is cast in stone. You can do any variation of these that you want. These are just ideas. Combining ranges means putting a puncher against a kicker, a puncher against a grappler, a kicker against a grappler, etc., etc. Again, it's forcing people into a foreign range. It's forcing them to fight from a weak point. Eventually, hopefully, we should get people that can kick, punch, and grapple. They can go to any range. So, to start off with, we've got a boxer against a boxer against a kicker. Okay. Okay. 
kicked out, the snow mode, they kicked out. They still don't have electricity. It's a kick. They did last talk. They go in. Good album. They go in. The next section is a boxer against a grappler. What you'll notice when you put reality into the uh, into the forum, when you put reality into the arena, everybody gets tired twice as quick because they know it's real. And they know that if they're not sharp, if they're not on the ball, they'll get knocked out, choked out, or they'll get damaged. So straight away, the adrenaline's going, the turbo drive's there, and the tank is getting emptied really, really quickly. OK, keep gloves. There you go. Okay, right, good. This is going down from back up again. Good leg. Get in there, Nick. Push his legs. And now he's been taking, go for it. Just the one. Okay, I'll do it. Keep going. Next time you watch a boxing match on the television, watch how many times the two fighters clash and are separated. That's reality. Even a good puncher is going to lose range. Not because he's not a good puncher, or not because he's not very good, but because that's the, that's the reality of things. So next time you watch a boxing match, watch how many times they touch, how many times they clash. That's how many times it would have gone to grappling in a real situation. On the last section, we've got a kicker against a grappler. You can mix and match these as much as you want. You can do it with weapons or, you know, like wooden knives. You can, uh, you can do it with anything you want. If your system is Arkido, then do Animal Day with uh, pretend knives or with pens. See how many times you get marked with a pen. If you think your system's going to work under pressure, the only way you're going to find out is to put it under pressure. Okay, so the last section of the restricted stuff is a kicker against a grappler. Okay. Go. Stand with his weight, as soon as you're in his range, get in there. Grab him, man, that's it. Brilliant, I'm right. Tie it up. Okay, as soon as you're down, tie it up. Good. Welcome to Animal Day. This is the final piece of the jigsaw. This is putting everything together. Uh, what we have now is no restrictions. We just put two people in the, in the centre. Normally they would volunteer. This, this gets people used to actually stepping forward against their own fears. And in the centre, anything goes. It needs to be done under strict supervision. This, this will prevent injuries. There's always going to be a risk of injuries. But, you know, if you want to make an omelette, you've got to break a few eggs. 
As we said before, with the biting, you bite and release. With the gouging, you touch the eyes and release. We're looking for these as finishing techniques in a serious situation, the last resort techniques, but more than that, we're, look, we're doing them to learn how to defend against them, because the enemy of today is a biter and a gouger. If you're not used to defending against it, then you've got problems. Um, more than anything, what we're doing here is we're, we're trying to strengthen people from the inside out. In Animal Day itself, they're actually facing all their fears head on. Uh, with all the other stuff, it's restricted. It's making them work on weak areas. It's making them strengthen weak areas. What Animal Day allows them to do is see where the weaknesses and strengths lie, see who they are. It's like a character x-ray, as I said at the, in the introduction. So in Animal Day, they will get pre-fight fear, in-fight fear, post-fight fear. They will learn to cope with uh, pain, with exhaustion, um, with injury, possibly with blood, um, and it will teach them to cope with big, big opponents and little opponents and it will eventually if they do it enough it will give them true power. True power is not being able to get other people to do what we want but getting ourselves to do what we want. So the real strength is from the inside out. We want 20 stone here. That's what Animal Day is going to do for us. Bridge over. See that one, man. 
Ah. And you try and climb over him as well. Come on, Shane. That's it, pull his hair. Good lift. Come on, Shane, fight him. That's good, Shane, well done. That's it, pull over, hook your leg round. Pull over. That's it, hook it round. Hey. Remember what we practiced in the escape? Once you saw them, pull back. Yeah. Once you saw them, that's it. And I'd be squeezing harder. That's it, Steve. That's it, Steve. Don't climb over. I think that's it, Steve. Pull over his leg. Go on, Andy. It's Steve. Keep holding him. That's it, Steve. Don't give up, Steve. Focus on him, Steve. Turn on him, Steve. Turn on him. Andy. Andy, mountain. Andy, mountain. Go on. That's it. Suffocate him. Andy, over the top. Keep going, Steve. Andy, your right leg over the top. Don't give in, Steve. Don't give in, Steve. Keep going, Steve. Andy, get on top of him. Your right leg over. Use your hand, Steve. Use your hand. Use your other hand. That's good, Steve. Just take control. Come on, Alex. Come on, Alex. Come on, Matty. Excellent. Come on, Alex. Keep the hold on. That's it, Matt. Use it. Push on it. Push on it. Come on, Alex. Fight it. Come on, Matty. Good. Come on, Alan. Come on, Flip him over, push your hips up, Paul. Push your hips up, Paul. Hey, Paul, just get him. Flip him over the other way. That's it. Push him up and over, Paul. I said, ah! It's a choke right now, Paul. That's it. I'll be like, get him out of that. Go on, Paul, keep going, mate. Don't give in. Come on, Paul. It's not on, just come back to him. Turn him, don't turn him, Paul. Give him away. Keep pushing him, Paul, keep pushing him. Good. Go ahead. Come on, turn him, Steve. I don't want to switch 